Ari, thank you, Kim and Ari, for making this possible. And for me sitting in Yafo and having really the privilege to interview Meir Shalev, who, who lives in Aloné Abba, which is really in Emek Israel, uh, about 10 minutes drive from where he was born, about 40 minutes drive where I was born in Kvutzat Geva in the same valley, about 15 minutes drive where my daughter and granddaughter live in Kibbutz Hanaton. Emek Israel is the heart of modern Israel. And each one of us, I think, who is somehow connected will have stories to tell, and I hope Mayor will do that for us. So Ari, what I suggest is maybe you could highlight Mayor and me for the rest of the audience. And I will start by putting a PowerPoint on, a, not for a long time, I'm not teaching you text, because you know, Mayor, and it's, I hope it's okay for me to call you by the first name, that one of, of course, the things of we Israelis often forget is that we take certain things for granted. And as I was preparing again this morning here in Israel, it was night for you out there, I figured maybe not everybody knows the meaning of your name. So here is Meir, he who lightens, he who gives the light. And here is Shalev, calm, peaceful. Are you indeed that, Meir? Giving light well, and... Well, and as, as, for, as for the light, I don't really know. As for the peacefulness, I, I'm certainly not. I, I don't think I'm a peaceful person. I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and, and the light is something that the others, other people should decide. But uh, okay. this is the name of my late grandfather. My, my, my father gave me this name. Uh, Meir, uh, it used to be uh, me, my grandfather's name on, on my father's side was Meir Baslavsky, mm -hmm. but my grandfather uh, changed his uh, uh, second name to Hebrew uh, and he made it Shalev. I, I think we were the first Shalev in Israel. This was still in mandatory times, at the British uh, mandate, uh, mandate uh, 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 times. Today there, there are many Shalevs in Israel, but uh, we were the first family to, to get this name. And none like you. So for the sake of you and maybe a few other people, you can see on the left-hand side of our slide, the emblem of CSP, the Community Scholars Program that Ari introduced to us. And just below a few houses from the community in which Mayor lives up north in the Valley of Jezel. And let yeah. us start and go right ahead to my first, maybe not really a question. First of all, indeed, people have mentioned the unbelievable number of books that you have written. So I collected a few cover pages and I'm inviting our audience to look quickly at those scanned cover pages and figure out how many you have read, how many you know, and what still needs to be on your list on your bucket list. It's not all, it's just a few that I could fit in so that you can see them. And unshamedly, I placed smack in the middle, the two I love best. The children's book, my father always embarrasses me and a pigeon and the boy that I'm totally in love with. So I took the protexia, the privilege of the interviewer and placed my two favorites smack in the middle. And Thank here's you. a map of Israel that includes the two places that you are biographically connected to. The first Moshav Nahalal with its very famous circle smack in the center of the valley of Jezreel, Emek Israel, as we say in Ivrit, and you can see it on the map. I gave two little red dots to suggest that one of them is Nahalal and the other is Alunei Abba, very near to each other up north. And of course, the central one, Yerushalayim, where your family moves not a long time after you were born. So you are in between these poles, and indeed poles there are, pulling Israel in different directions. The classical, mm -hmm. traditional heart of Israel, Yerushalayim, and the pioneering heart of modern Israel of the Zionist movement. 
Where are you between these two poles, Mayor? Well, I, I'm certainly uh, in the direction or the side of uh, Nahalal, not of Jerusalem. Uh, these are the two holy places, I would say, the two hol holy sites of, of modern day uh, Israel. And for a while we hoped that uh, Nahalal and uh, Dganya and Kinneret and Ein Harod will conquer and will be the, the light towers of our modern day, modern day in, uh, society. But uh, Jerusalem as always uh, w was winning, is, is, is the, the, top, the top holy place of our society. And, uh, and uh, I, I personally prefer Nahalal, uh, but Jerusalem is, is, the, is the true winner of this contest. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you so much for that. So if we have looked at the physical origin, let's look a little bit at the family, okay? So we have now on our slide on the left-hand side, one of the, there are not too many pictures of your father on the internet, but yes. I found you, <laughs> and I tell you in a minute why I chose this particular one. Because normally Wikipedia and such chooses other pictures, and I prefer this one where he is the person who leads the hikes with a Tanakh, who is a Bible in hand. Your father, Mordechai Shalev, a famous poet, and you know, I'm known is, for- is Yitzhak, is, Yitzhak sorry, is sorry, my father. Mordechai is the uncle, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yitzhak Shalev, thank you for the correction. A well-known poet, I actually teach some of his poetry in my classes, but it's not a secret that ideologically, the house, the home you grew up in is a right-wing, revisionist home. And I chose just a, an excerpt of one of his poems. Here is the Hebrew on the screen. I can read it. If you prefer to read your father's poem, Bevakasha, and then I can read my modest English translation. Okay? Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, but I see my father's photograph and I don't see his... You uh... don't see the text. Okay. All right. So let me no. do it. Okay. Okay. This is a poem I'm going through the English. The very same crushing hand liberator of cities. The same arm of retribution and revenge. How did it freeze helplessly facing the walls of the capital? Behold, it is moving yet turns back empty handed. The redeemer of Nitzanim, the savior of Yad Mordechai arose, none aroused for the city of God. Youth were sitting, holding their arms, grinding their teeth, their hands chained up in their lap. So this is a poem your father had written following the Six Day War, the miraculous victory of the Six Day War and how we are now in control of the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, etc. You do not need the details. He admires the heroism of those who in the War of the Independence liberated those kibbutzim in the South and yet stopped before owning the old city, before owning the Holy of Holy. And the youth were sitting, says your father, and their hands are tied and they cannot liberate. So your father is frustrated at that. Very short time afterwards, and we know when you were born, by the year 1969, you publish a poem. And I haven't seen too many of your poems, but this is one that is interesting to know. And I would like our audience to pay attention to the title in Hebrew. Al Da'at Hanearim, which echoes the voice of what we say before Kol Nidre in synagogue, Al Da'at Makom, Al Da'at Kahal, on the authority of, and you call it on the authority of the youth as if speaking to your father 
to people thinking like him who complain about not winning yet another holy place. Again, a quick translation of mine. Wow to the armchair fighters, soldiers of paper and pen, laying in ambush in warm beds, conquerors of targets while writing at their desk. It's here and I promise all our participants through Ari that I will send you the text because I want you to hear Mayor today and not me. Mayor, will you tell us about the origin of the poem? What brought you to write a text in absolute contrast to the ideology that you grow up in? The people who want to conquer and you are opposing and criticizing them. Well, um, I, I was a soldier uh, at, at the, uh, in 1967, in the Six Day War, I was fighting in the Golan Heights, where two of my friends were, were killed. Then half a year later, I was wounded uh, myself. I was shot by four bullets and I was dismissed from army service ever since. And uh, I had my first uh, contradiction, my first uh, 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 talk with my father right after the war. I, I got uh, my first uh, leave from 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 uh, from my army from the army service uh, about uh, two months after the war. I visited my my parents. Uh, it was a very moving uh, uh, visit. Uh, they they saw me uh, uh, well and alive. And then I had this conversation with my father, who was, as you said, a, a right winger. I specifically did not have any specific uh, opinion at that time, but I told my father that I saw all the Palestinians, uh, uh, towns and villages and people in the West Bank. And I told, I, I said the sentence that drove him really mad he was very angry at me i said we that this victory is a bite i told him this victory is a bite we will suffocate on this was my phrasing this is i told him we, uh, in hebrew lakachnu bis mimenu we took a bite we will suffocate on he was very angry when he heard it we had a, a, a verbal uh, a fight over it uh, and later, when I was after I was wounded and dismissed from the army, uh, um, I wrote this little poem that, that you showed and, 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 and read. There was a, there was a famous right wing uh, poet at that time, Uri Zvi Greenberg, who was publishing uh, these right wing uh, uh, fanatic uh, religious. Uh, 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 poems about uh, our conquering of, the, of the, the land of our patriarchs, the land of our forefathers. And I had several friends who were killed at that time, uh, uh, one after the other. I, I was serving in, 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 a, in a sort of a reconnaissance uh, unit in the army. And I one night, I just jumped out of bed. I, I'm not a poet. I, this is the only poem poem I published ever, ever. And I'm so happy and, I found it. <laughs> and I, I was so angry because my friends were killed one after the other. For this is for me stupid issue of of uh, having uh, uh, possession over the the holy places. Uh, this tomb and the other tomb and, and the, the, where David was sitting and Solomon was sleeping and Rachel was dying and whatever. And I wrote this poem who, who made my, my father angry and myself angry. But, but I, I bec after the Six Day War, I myself became what you can call today uh, a right wing, uh, um, a left winger. Uh, because I'm in a, in a way I consider myself a practical person, uh, and 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 I I, I think that uh, we should be very practical about this uh, very unpractical region of the world uh, as the Middle East. Yes. Oh. 
thank you. You know, I'd like to take you back and everybody else to our PowerPoint with the following issue or question. So it seems very clear that you were not willing to inherit the right-wing ideology of your father, yet there is something that you did take from his teaching. And that I think is the connectedness to Tanakh, to the Bible. What I put on the screen just to prompt maybe your answer is three different writings of yours as connected to Tanakh. So one of yes. them is the children's book about the flood and the snake and the two arcs. And the two others are not children books, but also very different. So Tanakh now, Meir Shalev, who became the Tanakh of very many people like myself. And another book of reflections of firsts and beginnings in the Tanakh. And I'm sure that this is not all. And I'm sure that your connectedness to that major book from which we all come is way richer and more complex. Will you share some of it with us? What's Tanakh to you? Well, uh, I wanted to emphasize that that I inherited and, and learned from my father a lot, a lot of other topics uh, except his political opinions. And, and I also want to emphasize the fact that, that the, our political differences did, did, not, did not make us enemies. I mean, we were a very good couple of uh, father and son, and I'm grateful uh, uh, to my for uh, for my father of uh, teaching me a, a lot. He knew about the Hebrew language, about the Hebrew literature, about literature in general, about the Hebrew uh, uh, Bible, and especially the the Bible stories. I mean, his knowledge of the Bible and the Hebrew. Knowledge, uh, Hebrew language were far, far uh, deeper and larger than mine, but but he, he inherit, inherited me this uh, reading the Hebrew Bible in a secular way. Uh, we are not a religious family, we are not uh, observant uh, uh, people, and my father read the Bible uh, with a great knowledge, but uh, in in a very critical way. And this is the way I read the Bible today. I, I, I read the, the, the Bible stories in a secular way. I don't think the heroes of the Bible are holy people. I object the whole idea of holiness uh, in general. Uh, and, and the Bible itself, I believe, the Hebrew Bible itself, I believe is critical about many of his uh, heroes. As a matter of fact, there are no perfect uh, heroes in the Hebrew Bible. We did not, uh, we do not have this uh, attitude of the Muslim Quran or the Christian uh, 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 New Testament. Testaments. Uh, uh, New Testaments. Uh, we do not consider uh, even Moses and Abraham and King David are criticized by the Bible itself. And, and this is the way I'm, I was taught to read the Bible by my father, and this is the way I read it, yes. And so, Mayor, maybe many of our listeners did not read Tanakh Akshav. Could you give just one example? If one of them was to open Tanakh Akshav Bible now and read it, what would they find that will be different in your reading, in your Midrash of the Tanakh story? Well, they will find that uh, that uh, uh, Jacob, for example, uh, was a liar. Uh, I mean, he is the father of us all. He is the father of all the people of, of Israel. This is Israel is the second name of, of Jacob in the Bible. So he is the father of all of us. But still, he is a liar as the name Jacob, Yaakov in Hebrew. Uh, refers. I mean, this is the meaning of his name, uh, a liar. Uh, they will find that, that uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac gave their wives. Abraham gave his wife Sarah. Uh, Isaac gave his wife uh, uh, Rebecca, Rivka, to other people, to other kings, foreign kings. Uh, they will find what the Bible itself is writing that. Uh, uh, 
Dave, King David was a fornicator, a murderer, uh, and, and, and all these facts are not hidden by the Bible. These are facts that later interpreters of the Bible tried to hide. And also the book of Chronicles, uh, in the, the last book of the Bible, tried to erase. But still, all these are written in the Bible, in, in the Jewish Bible. And, and this, this uh, I appreciate it a lot. I think it's a very original approach of the Jewish tradition uh, uh, to, to its own history. Hmm. Does any of this come into your novels, Mayor? The, the, the person Jacob, uh, our uh, third uh, uh, forefather, is, 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 is there in my, in my books. Uh, I like very much uh, the patience that uh, Jacob had waiting for his love to come true. Uh, in my book, in English, uh, the, the title in Hebrew is uh, As a Few Days, but the title in English, uh, the, it has... Two titles in, in, in English. One is uh, Four Meals, and the other is The Loves of uh, Judith. The Loves of Judith, in, yeah. In, I love in, that. in England and in the United States. But, but in Hebrew, it is As a Few Days. And As a Few Days is a quote from the book of Genesis about Jacob uh, working for, uh, for, for Rachel for seven years. And they seemed, these seven years seemed to him as a few days because of his love to her. And this verse always captured my imagination and later my appreciation. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful verse in, in Jewish uh, uh, history and in Hebrew literature. And, and I, I want to emphasize this, the Bible for me is Hebrew literature in the first place. I am very suspicious about the spiritual and about the historical value of the Bible. And I think the people who wrote these pieces of, of, of the Bible as our history uh, and our uh, spiritual uh, heritage, I would say they were not the most talented writers in the world. But the literary value of the biblical stories is, is unbelievable. And for me, as a writer today, as a Hebrew writer today, the feeling of belonging to this dynasty of, of Hebrew writers, which is a, a, a four or 3,000 years old dynasty, is very, very important. I mean, generally, uh, we, maybe we are the only nation in which a, a modern day, a modern day Hebrew writer can read a text, a literary text that was written 3,000 or 2,000 years ago and understand most of it. It's unbelievable. I mean, if you give a Greek person or an Italian person, the texts of Homer or Ovid that were written at the same time, they will understand nothing of it. We can read these old texts and understand not all of it, but a great part of it. And uh, sometimes when I'm invited uh, abroad to, to Europe or the United States to talk about my, my books, and I tell my listeners, look, if King David or Jesus Christ, both nice Jewish boys, will come now into this room, I will be able to talk to them. It's unheard of. I will be able to tell them what I think about their, their preachings, about their writing. I will be able to give them a book of mine and ask them for their opinion. Uh, uh, I, I, I would say uh, they will not understand anything that has to do with modern day technology. They will not understand words like uh, radio, television, uh, computer, internet, whatever. But 
we can talk, we could talk about love, we could talk about longing, we could talk about memory, we could talk about death, we could talk about yearning, we could talk about revenge. So and let me jump is, in. This is literature. This is literature. This is literature. I'm totally with you on that one, and I hope our listeners are too. But I'd like to ask you to stay with the Temer thing for a couple of more minutes. Okay. Beyond the language and the writing and the literature, which is the source of our symbols, metaphors, stories, everything, there is also the physical connectedness. And it is your father who created this educational methodology of going on hikes in Israel with an open Tanakh in hand that became our tradition. And when we got the list of what to bring on a tiyul, at the end, it always said, Sefer Tanakh v'meimiya, <laughs> a Bible book and a water can. This, even kids who do not know that, we got that from your father. Is there a place in your life for that particular aspect of connecting Tanakh to places? Like when you open your window in the Valley of Jezreel and look at the Carmel every morning, do you think of Elijah? Do you think of well, the book? First, I will show you the very true, real Bible book my father carried in his hand. Oh, eye. please do, please do. That's so special. Uh, here it is. You can wow. see it's, it's very old. It is already binded uh, together with a tape. It, it's a very old Bible. This was in my in my father's uh, 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 rucksack where when we were hiking, and he took us to to uh, when he was talking about King David. We went to Emek HaElah, not far from Jerusalem, where David slew Goliath. If you, we talked about uh, Elijah, Eliyahu, we went to Mount Carmel. That the very same spot you mentioned that I can see from one, my window today, where Eliyahu brought uh, rain and killed all the prophets of the Baal. And if we talked about Jonah, Jonah, <clears throat> the prophet, we went to the little port That's of Jaffa. My neighborhood. This is yeah, where I live. So, so my, my father was very keen about showing us that the Bible took place in our land in very specific places. And all these places are very dear to me. I mean, this is the right way to study the Bible. And if you live in Israel, you, you can do it. I mean, if you <clears throat> live in uh, <clears throat> Germany, or Russia, or in the United States, you can only read about it. But if you come to Israel, <clears throat> you can go to the very places where uh, Jacob and Abraham and David and, and Jonah and Elijah and, and uh, other characters, heroes of the Bible were acting. <clears throat> so everything was very alive. Everything was, was very convincing. And as, as, as a young boy, this was a true intellectual uh, adventure for me. Sure. So I thank you so much for that. I was really hoping to open this. I could not hope for seeing your father's Tanakh. That was a special <laughs> thing, the Darava for that. And I'm going to move to the next one, which is connected to everything around you physically right now. And that's a special nonfiction book that you have written, which is called My Wild Garden. And it's all about plants and stuff. And let me tell everybody that I had the privilege of having a telephone conversation with Mayor about two weeks ago, planning this meeting. And I suggested to read a little bit of the Willboro chapter. And he says, nah, that's not interesting enough. Do the sea squill, do the chatzav. So first of all, tell me, why did you choose the chatzav, the sea squirrel? What's so special about it? And I have on the screen, of course, the relevant chapter from your book. So will you address this? Will you read to us some? How do you want to go about explaining the importance of your wild garden in your life? Well, 
first the 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 chatzav, or what you call in English the sea squeal is 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 a plant that I really admire because you have to understand the climate of the Middle East where I live, where Israel is, <clears throat> where the, the winter is not very generous. Uh, we don't have very, a lot of water at winter time. The summer is very hot, very, very uh, uh, dangerous, Dry. I would say, to, to the plants. And usually we have this circle of life and death where in the winter and springtime we have flowers and we see green uh, uh, around us in the winter in the summer everything is yellow and dead and this by the way is the source of many uh, myths greek myths uh, 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 egyptian myths canaanite uh, hebrew uh, uh, babylonian myths of uh, life and death uh, um, and 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 uh, and the, the chatzav, the, the sea squeal, is a plant that gives its flowers in, in summertime. Uh, uh, most of the flowers give, uh, are blooming at uh, winter and, and, and springtime. When they have some water and they, can, and they can live, but in summertime, it is very difficult <clears throat> to, 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 to have your to flowers. And I appreciate this, uh, this attitude of, of the sea squeal to give flowers in, in summertime when it is very, very difficult. Uh, the sources of energy in, and water and humidity in summertime are very limited, but still the sea squeal gives its flower at, uh, in, in July, August, very hard uh, uh, months. Because then it doesn't have to compete with other plants, with other flowers, uh, on, on on the visiting uh, of, of uh, insects. Uh, every flower is depend on insects that visits its visit its flowers and take the pollen uh, from one flower to another, from one uh, uh, plant to to another. So it, in, in winter and springtime, they have to compete. They have to be more conspicuous. They have to be more uh, attractive. But the sea squeal decided uh, to bloom in July, August, and then it can allow itself to give very simple, uh, modest, white, not colorful, but white flowers. Because at this time, there is no other flower around. You can see even uh, the, the, the flowers are so scarce that not only bees and, and wasps and insects are attracted to it, but also hummingbirds. They, they don't have any, of our flower, any other flower uh, uh, around. And this is a policy that I appreciate. And it is also a very, very stubborn, strong, plant, no, no animal or insect is eating it. No bird is harming it. it. It is a very, very strong flower. I have a lot of sea squills in my garden. It is also planted by people in cemeteries in the Middle East because no animal can destroy it. No, no insect can, can bite it. Uh, um, and and it, it, it also shows you the cleanliness of the deceased because it's a white flower. And it was used in many, many years ago, 2000 years ago in Second Temple time, until today by Arab uh, farmers as uh, 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 marks of the border between, uh, between the plots of, 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 uh, of uh, fields. Uh, because it is there for many, many generations. Um, so May this, I, this is I a plan. Here is Pardon? what I suggest. I have all the sea squirrel chapter on my screen. I will go okay. slowly. And if you see a paragraph that you would like to share with us, stop me. Can you follow me on the screen? Well, 
Ah, now I can see the two dominant flowers in my wild just garden. Just tell okay. me when to move on. I can move on. I have oh, the whole side chapter. Okay, ju just a second. I will see where it is in the Hebrew. Um, because I I prepared the, the, the piece about the wheelbarrow. Ah, okay. But you persuade as, me. As, as, as you ask me to, so uh, just okay. a second. A, as so I, said, I, I will read, listen, I, I will read the piece about the, the, the wheelbarrow in, in Hebrew okay. because, okay, so it says, uh, I'm reading in Hebrew. So and, read a couple uh, of lines and I will translate, okay, as okay. best I can. Okay, it is a Hasa'ata shel ameritza, pshuta ve intuitivit more chiva alufanaim. וכמו ברכיבה של אופניים, גם בה אפשר להשתפר או להתמקצע, להשכיב okay, את המריצה. אוקיי, so moving the wheelbarrow around is as intuitive as riding a bike. And just like riding a bike, you can get better at it. You can improve yourself at moving it around. Please continue. מאז רכשתי לי מריצה, כבר הסעתי בה אדמה, אבנים. עצי הסקה, שקי קומפוסט, חול, מלט, עציצים, כל מיני אשפה ופסולת, עשבים שוטים שעקרתי, עשב, ענפים שגזמתי, ארגזי ספרים מהמכונית לחדר העבודה. Okay, not a chance that I will remember all of this. <laughs> okay. I will try as best and, I can. And so I will read it in English. In, in my English, I'm sorry, I apologize to my okay. official Okay, so there is a misunderstanding between and, the two. And I, I, also, I also carried my uh, uh, granddaughter uh, when she was three years old, and she asked this trip in a wheelbarrow. And, uh, uh, and, and I carried her around in the fields, lying in, in my wheelbarrow. Wherever I use my wheelbarrow, I wonder how come I lived without it before. And I'm an, an, uh, 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 amazed by the ingenuity in the simple structure of, of, of the wheelbarrow uh, uh, as, a, as a working uh, uh, vehicle. It has the character the balance and maturity that gives me not only uh, 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 usefulness, but also pleasure. I think every person, not only gardeners and farmers and builders, should have a wheelbarrow at home uh, with small changes of structure. You can use it to bring the pots and utensils from the table to the, to the sink the books from the bed to the, to the shelves, laundry from the machine to the ropes, and your partner who fell asleep in front of the television to bed. Okay, uh, I think that's really a very original use of the wheelbarrow. And I'd like to sum up this part before I come to the next one, to say mm -hmm. that reading the wheelbarrow, one of those tools that you treat humorously, and I was amazed, and I hope our listeners too, at your description of the character of the sea squirrel. Its strategies, the, its the, attitudes. The, the character, I'm sorry, I did not hear. Of the, the character. Chatsar, of the Chatsar. Ah, okay, okay. It is a real human character. It, it has is? strategies, it has policies, it has attitudes. I am waiting for a novel in which a Chatzav-like character will be <laughs> the center. But let me ask you a question about something that I was wondering yet. I love mm -hmm. your, children's your children's books. I already said that. Thank you. And, Thank you. and when I, I researched a, for, you, for this interview, I discovered that very little was translated into other languages. Unlike your other literature, not the children's literature, which is, you know, available in many, many languages of the world. We see Lola, who is Hakina Nechama, of course, and we see a Kramer in Hebrew only. We see my father always embarrasses me, which is a little bit of a personal story. 
why do you think so few of your children's books get across the language barrier? Well, uh, first, my, my, more of my children's books were translated to European languages than to English, especially in, in the United States. Uh, uh, I have m many books were translated to German, to Dutch, and to, Ita to Italian and Spanish. But, but uh, in English, it's, it's more complicated because the, the American market especially is, is, is very, I would say, careful, uh, very politically correct. My books are not very politically correct. Uh, and, and my children's books, I mean, are not politically correct in the way the American uh, readers uh, uh, judge it. And... and uh, but generally, it is it, the, the publishers of children's books are more careful than the publishers of uh, uh, grown-ups because they, 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 there is something in the illustrations and the text of, of children's books which is a little more difficult to deliver in, in a different language. And, and the publishers are, are more careful. For example, my father always embarrasses me that you can see on the screen is my most translated uh, children book uh, in, 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 in many languages. One of them is Japanese, by the way. And I was very flattered to hear my, my Japanese publisher sent me an article that was published in, in Tokyo, in a paper in Tokyo, saying that they wonder how come a, a Western uh, writer could write a book that shows so much understanding of the Japanese family. <laughs> and it shows you that since I have no idea about the Japanese family and I, 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 have, I, I have no knowledge of the Japanese culture, but I think it shows you that uh, beyond all the obstacles and all differences, I think that uh, human beings are very much alike all over the world, that we all know when we talk about love and when we talk about parents and children and, 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 and family, even if you live in Afghanistan or in Canada, still there is something very much uh, uh, similar, very similar to, to one another. I would like to suggest to our listeners that my father always embarrasses me. How old is it, Mayor? 25, 30 years old? No, no, this is more, this is about 35 years old. I can 35. tell you exactly because my daughter is now 45 and I wrote it when she was about four, when she was about five years old. Mm -hmm. So it's a 40 years old book. It's about my daughter who was really embarrassed about my uh, 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 behavior. And you know that children generally are very, co they are conformists. They, they obey the, the rules more than we expect them. And she thought that I don't know how to behave and I was embarrassing her. And, and this book is uh, in a way is my, is my official autobiography. This is a, uh, uh, and but also in the larger spectrum, and since you have mentioned political correctness, let me tell you that in my teaching of Israeli children's literature, this was such a gift when it came, because it was actually the first feminist children's book that yeah. I came across <laughs> in Israel. It was such a gift, unbelievable, because in this family, the father who doesn't know how to behave and knows how to bake, etc. While the mother, and he is a little bit afraid of scary movies and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the mother is the one who has the career. And yes, the is mother is a very successful television personality. Yeah, exactly. And she yeah. cannot take the time and to the bake. Father is a kind of, the father is a kind of a bum. But he <laughs> is a very, he's a, he's a, I think he's a funny character. And this is the way I was when I was a young father myself. I can tell you that the part I loved most and my listeners did is when you have her click, click, click of the high heels of the mother and the click, click, click of the typewriter of the father. 
I yes. thought it was such a perfect, beautiful use of sound in the book. And it, so it later, shows you it shows you the age of the book because in this book exactly. people are still writing on a typewriter. Absolutely, you, you didn't have the word processor yet. Yeah. yeah, but the high heels did stay with us. And let's move a, to a maybe you know what is closest to my heart. So pigeon and the boy. We I could now start the whole conversation for a whole hour just about this one. And Kim, you are nodding, so we may have a private conversation about it. Okay. And I call tirale tirale and all the rest. <laughs> this is what I call. So first of all, a I won't worry too much about be doing spoilers. What's the pigeon? Where did you get the pigeon? And why is it the heart of the story, this homing pigeon? Well, the, the, when I started to write this book, I, I, I wanted to write a, a, a book about a, a man who leaves his place and his uh, wife and uh, starts a new life in 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 a village uh, uh, and and i i wanted to use the pigeon as a metaphor of home loving of uh, the connection between a person and and his place and then i started to do my research about homing pigeons and I discovered a, a big, new, interesting world that I did not uh, guess before. I met people who raised homing pigeons. I met very old people who used homing pigeons at times of war, in, in the War of Independence in Israel in 1948. They still used uh, homing pigeons to deliver messages from one place to, to another. And it is then that the pigeons became a main issue uh, in the book. They became not only a symbol of home loving, but they became a character uh, uh, in, in itself. And, uh, and uh, I, I was amazed by the stories that I heard from uh, homing pigeons, uh, handlers, uh, uh, old people uh, in Israel and some people who grow them raise them uh, today uh, as a hobby and i was i was captured by by the by this uh, magic uh, bird whose only issue in life is going back home this is the only thing a homing pigeon wants to do is going back home and this is something that really uh, touched my my heart in very deep uh, places so it touched the hearts of many, but let me just open up a little entry into the book. This okay. home -coming thing, when the book starts, and let me tell you that I've been teaching a pigeon and a boy in the San Simon Park to really? many, yes, through wow, the this is This is the very place where the, where the, where the battle took place, where the, the homing pigeon handler released, uh, dispatched his uh, pigeon and died after it, it so left. I yes. do pigeon and the boy tours in Catamon. <laughs> and, and, but what I would like to, to really put a finger on is when the book opens, I know it by heart. The person really? who speaks is not an Israeli and not a pigeon handler. He is an Israeli who left Israel and came back home, and he is the one who yeah. started the story. And I he think lives I'm in the United States. He he yeah. he 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 was a palmachnik. You know, I I, I will tell the, the listeners, the the viewers, that the palmach was the, the previous uh, uh, military organization of, of of ours before the the IDF, before the Israeli uh, the defense uh, force. And uh, after the war, and he took part in this battle over the monastery of San Simon in Jerusalem. And later he immigrated to, to America where he lives uh, today. And, and uh, he visits this place where he was fighting and, and talks about it. Yeah. Okay. So I think that of all your many books, this is the one that gives voice to a Jew who does not live in Israel. 
And uh, I, I have it also. I have it also in my second novel in Isau. Uh -huh. my, narr my narrator, the narrator of Isau, also lives in the United States. And by the way, the the, the narrator of the book I'm writing these days uh, today also lives in the United States. So this, I think, is an element that is good for our listeners uh, to to know about that they come into this larger world of the characters. And mm -hmm. I have one more question, and then Ari, I will let you take over and maybe monitor some of the questions. We talked about your connectedness to that amazing source of literature, the Tanakh. But when we read Pigeon and the Boy, we can trace other literary sources. So we can see touches of Bialik, Touches of Chernichovsky, Touches of Nathan Alterman from Irayona, Dove City. We cannot do all of them because I don't have a semester seminar with you. So just a little bit, I'm leaving Bialik on the screen. And here is the famous Bialik poem, Mechoresha, yeah. Bat Yonim Homiya. And as you read along this particular poem, uh, you can come to the last a uh, verse the last stanza it's about this longing breaking through a closed gate and call the enone the yona im naar adain midapkim al deletashar there is no voice no answer and the pigeon with a boy are still knocking on the gate's door your title is pure bialik how do yeah, you... I took I took the title of my book. I took from Bialik. I made a slight uh, change. Bialik said, "A pigeon with a boy." I I wrote my title is "A pigeon and a boy," uh, but of course it is uh, it is taken from Bialik. And I wanted the people who can like you who are well versed, well read, uh, who will recognize it. Uh, to, 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 be, to, to be attentive to, to this title. Do you, can you elaborate maybe in a minute or two about this inner conversation, intertextual conversations between the generations that writers of today talk to Bialik, who talk to Yudlamit Gordon, who talk to earlier ones, and all of us talk to the Tanakh. Can you well? I, I have a special. I have a special connection to to Bialik. Uh, I, I was a high school uh, uh, pupil, high school student, in the in the early sixties of last uh, century, previous uh, century, and I always had this feeling that the Israeli Ministry of Education uh, tries very hard. Uh, to to make us uh, sick of Bialik, to make us to, to make Bialik. Israeli students unable to read Bialik, don't uh, not keen to read, not happy to read Bialik because the 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 the, uh, the, the poems they selected for us were the most boring educational national whatever poems they could find. So when our teacher was reading us the most boring lines of Bialik, I was reading the other poems of yeah, Bialik yeah. Under, under my desk. And uh, this is one of them. And, uh, and, and Bialik is, was so good and was so interesting, even though so old, it's uh, two generations b b b above me. Uh, and still I loved him. A lot. I loved uh, his uh, erotic uh, uh, poems, uh, like the hungry eyes, and I liked the the sea of uh, the sea of 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 of, of uh, Yam Had Mama Polet Sodot. How will you translate it? The sea the, of solitude. The sea of silence. Yes, of the sea of silence emits uh, secrets. Uh, uh, you are uh, at me, me. You are leaving me. Uh, these poems I was reading under my desk while my teacher was reading us all the national uh, 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 horrible uh, poems by by Bialik, and I have this I have this closeness 
to be Alex uh, 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 poetry, and I used it in 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 this book. Yes, I'm grateful to be Alex. And we are grateful to you. And I'd like Ari to hand it over to you a little bit and maybe pick up a few of the questions that might have come up in the chat and a, give them to Mayor to address. How do you feel about doing sure. that? Sure, we'll just take a few more minutes. Thank I want you, to, Rachel. Um, I want to thank you, Rachel, thank for you. a yeah, terrific interview. Thank you, Mayor, for answering so honestly. So here are a few Thank questions you. that have come up either in my own brain and mostly from mm -hmm. our great audience. In my own brain, it's just a question. You are considered one of the great writers of Israel. Your books that I have read, thanks to Lizzie Silver, are they are biblical in nature, particularly A Pigeon and the Boy and what we call the Blue Mountain. Are you recognized on the street? So when you walk, when you go for a visit to Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, do people know who you are and then say something to you or are you unrecognized? I, I am recognized, but not only because of my literary work, but also because years ago, about uh, 30, 40 years ago, I, I was a, a television uh, person. I, I had my own talk show. Uh, and, and somehow, even though I lost most of my hair, uh, st people still recognize me somehow. So, but now they recognize me as an author, not as a TV person. Uh, but but I, I am recognized in the street, yes. Uh, and when people, do people, I wouldn't say accost you, but if they recognize you, do they say, hello, I like your books, or do they start to engage you in conversations about your... They, they okay. say, sometimes they say, hello, I like your book. Sometimes they say, hello, I hate your column in the daily paper, because uh, not, not everyone in Israel like my political opinions. I'm, as I told, I'm a left winger. I'm, I'm, I, I do not obey. Uh, I'm not a Likudnik. I do not belong to the to the present day uh, 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 government uh, opinion. So some people try to argue with me. Some people are very angry at me. But mostly, I'm welcomed by readers who who, who like my books or even tell me. I was growing up with your children books, which I like most. This is something that I really like to, uh, 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 to hear. And uh, sometimes it's a little embarrassing where people with, uh, uh, who look quite old tell me, I was growing up with your children books. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, it is, uh, but, but uh, I, I, I like to talk to people ab about my books. Terry, Terry, one of our audience participants, wants to know, since you write about Americans or Israelis, I guess, who come, move to America and then come back to Israel for your, uh -huh. to, be, to be a center of the book, do, have you spent a lot of time in the United States? And if so, where have you No, I, I, I have never, never lived in another country but Israel. I, I, I traveled all, all, around the, all around the world. I was in Mongolia, I was in Australia, uh, and I was all over uh, Europe and in, in Canada and the United States, but, but I never lived anywhere else. I was offered very generously uh, to, to stay in some uh, uh, university campuses and some uh, private uh, homes in, in many places in the world and to write, write people want me to write uh, in, in their place, but, but I like to write uh, on the table uh, 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 in which, where I'm sitting right now. This is my eating table, my write, writing table, my uh, uh, hosting table. Uh, I, I like my home. I'm like the pigeon, the pigeon in my book. And I have to ask, do you have an outdoor shower? Yes, I have a very nice outdoor shower with with uh, hot water as well. Wow. Uh, after, after I mentioned uh, uh, an outdoor shower the second time in, in, in a book of mine, my daughter told me, it seems you really want to have an outdoor shower. And she and her uh, uh, husband built me uh, an outdoor shower. And I use it uh, uh, very often. It's very nice. For those of you who do not understand why I ask this question, this is an <laughs> important feature of a pigeon and the boy, the outdoor shower. Yeah. 
So <laughs> this was just in reference to yeah, that. It's very nice to take a shower outside. My my outdoor shower is is uh, under one tree and behind the second tree, and I'm quite well hidden. And then it's very nice to have a shower outdoors. Yeah. So when you know one of our future CSP events, we'll come to your house and just stand outside while you shower. We assume it's. Covered, <laughs> but we'll just be. It's it. It's in the back side of of, of the right. house, uh, and and uh, only my neighbors know about it. I hope they don't take pictures and then put me on <laughs> Facebook or something. Facebook. Yeah, but but I'm I'm well I'm well uh, I'm I'm. It's it's a very modest uh, outdoor shower. Well, when we when we do come to Israel, we are hoping to have we have many options on our programs. One is the walking tour. We call it the Pigeon and the Boy walking tour, not the shower tour, in yeah, which Rachel. Sneak, if if you sneak into the back side of my garden, you can see uh, okay. my my outdoor shower. Yes. Okay. Well, if we're in the area, but 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 we probably will do the Rachel walking tour of Pigeon and a Boy, and I'm just going to you know, you'll be invited as a surprise guest. So don't Thank tell you. anybody. And I just want you there, like wear a hat and just join the group. And then at some point, Rachel will say, look who we have with us. Uh, Dorothea. I will gladly, yeah, great. Uh, I, will I will glad you join you. Okay. It's a, it's a date. Dorothea um, asked a great question, which is your characters are so rich in your books and so, uh, yeah, um, so real. Do you base them on real people that you know, or are they complete fabrications from your um, Well, uh, some some of my characters are having parts of people I know. No, nobody, no, no character in my books is a full uh, real character. I don't have, not, not even one character in my book is a real person from real life. But, but my mother, for example, is present in several women in, in, in my book. I myself uh, is there um, um, my son is 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 there partially? Which which character uh, is you? Well, I'm a little Uri in a, a Russian novel in my Blue Mountain, the title in 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 English. I'm a little of Esau uh, also. Um, my ex-wife is a, a little bit of Alona in Fontanella. It's a book that was was not translated to English yet. Uh, um, and and my mother is the most common visitor in in my books. I have like twenty five questions about why about in the pigeon of the boy why you killed off the character. <laughs> I told you the, the, book. I mean, the, the, so, the narrator. Yes. Why did I kill Yair, the narrator? Well, th there are two answers. The rude answer will be because I can. You know, I'm I'm a writer. I can kill my characters if if I want to. But but this is not the true answer. It has some truth in it, but it's not the real true answer. But my, my true answer is that uh, when his father, the pigeon handler managed to send i i don't want to make a spoiler so i talk uh, i will talk don't carefully I, I understand you read the whole book you know the whole book but i will talk uh, carefully not to to disclose some some uh, 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 surprises in the book anyway when when the pigeon handler sent his last pigeon with the last letter to his beloved woman in a way he won the war uh, against death. He, 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 he gave himself life, even though he was dying, even though he died after he was injured, after he was shot. Uh, he gave himself some kind, he gave himself a continuation of a second generation. <clears throat> and death who is there present in, in this scene. Death, death is there walking around. Is angry, is disappointed, is, is frustrated. So I think uh, uh, it, it, I, I killed uh, my narrator Yair because I wanted to give death a final victory uh, in this plot. It's uh, this is something very personal. I, the, the the way the pigeon handler was shot 
in 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 uh, in 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 the independence war is very similar to the way I was shot in 1967 when when I was a soldier. The closeness of death is is uh, following me ever since. I I'm, I always feel. The, I, I'm not post-traumatic. Don't misunderstand me. I'm perfectly okay. Don't don't worry. But but I I have this feeling of the closeness of death and also the feeling of victory uh, that I won that that I could have been killed. I was shot by four bullets and I'm alive. And I have this feeling is very strong in my personality, in my being. And uh, so, so I, I, I elaborated on that in my book, In a Pigeon and a Boy. Terrific. Um, I'm going to give Ari, Shen, and Kim an opportunity to ask a question since they really are the people who, um, you know, helped make this program possible. So I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute Ari and Kim. Did you have a question you would like to ask Mayor to share with our audience before we take leave? Obviously, we struck a nerve, Ari, because look how many people you have. My question is the one I posed at the beginning. Why did Mirkin marry Feige? Well, I did not hear you well. Excuse me. Please repeat. Why did Mirkin, why did Yaakov Mirkin marry Feige? <laughs> this is in Blue Mountain. Well, in a way, it was a decision of, of his group. It's not his own personal decision and many many things that had to do with the private lives of these pioneers were decided by the group by the collective not by the the person himself and he was sort of obeying the decision of of his uh, community this is why he married uh, uh, Fege, and and uh, this is why he was vengeful. This is why he wanted to take revenge uh, in his later years. Yeah. So my last question before I turn it back to Rachel to wrap up is, you mentioned you're working on your, your newest project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'm writing a very different kind of, of, of a novel now. I'm, I'm very near the end by, no, by now. I'm, it, it's very different because it has nothing to do with the history of Israel. It is not a broad saga of a family with uh, three generations. It has nothing to do with the Valley of Jezreel. It has nothing to do with agriculture and nature. It is a man and a woman uh, spending one night together. Mm. And of course, the, there is a, a background to both of them. Uh, the, uh, each of them has some kind of a history, but it's a very different kind of a novel. And, and uh, it is based on, on, on an episode that uh, happened to me many years ago. Uh, the one thing I, I can tell is the is that the man is very very handsome is 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 a great looking person very nice looking man so you can understand it's not autobiographical novel <laughs> and and uh, and uh, and uh, this is one of the issues uh, in his life. And uh, he is also very short-sighted, much more short-sighted th than I am, myopic, more myopic th th than I am. And uh, and he tells about he tells his brother about this night with uh, this woman. This is the story. It's very mm -hmm. different. It will be. Sh it is shorter. It is more concise. It is uh, more erotic than my other novels. Do you, wait, do you have a working name for the book? Uh, Sigalit wants to know. Yeah, I have a title for the book. I may change it, but the title right now is "Pa uh, Machat uh, at, at least once. once. At least once. Awesome. At least once. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we've gone through <laughs> the history, Rachel. We to the contemporary writing. Can you? Wrap it up for us, but I want to thank you again for conducting a terrific interview, and I want to thank Mayor for joining us, and it's a late for you, so yeah. I understand. 
Thank you. Th thank you so much for inviting me. It was a, a nice experience for me. And Rachel is a great interviewer. And you are very friendly people. And I look at the, at the faces and everybody is, is interesting and nice. Thank you so much. So thank you to Dababa for really Dabba letting Kasha. us walk you through your many books and influences. It was a real treat for me personally. And I'm looking forward maybe to some future opportunities to participants in this program. Uh, Ari, I think some people, if not all, will appreciate maybe for me putting together a compilation of the sources, the poems that were quoted, the Wilboro part, uh, etc. I'll put together a source sheet for you. I'll let you have it before you send people the link to the recording so you can include it in your follow up. Is that okay? All right. Uh, you asked me? Thank no. you, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day in California. Good evening in the East Coast and Laila Tov <laughs> in Israel. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye Thank bye. you, Ari and Kim. Bye bye. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Keep safe. Mm -hmm. So, Rachel, you, you heard it. He'll join us yeah. on our tour with you. I'm going to, I will I'll tell him. do the tour. I'll do the tour. We'll get him dressed and up in a mustache and a hat and, and put him in a... We have a date in Yafo, raiding Jonah by the port and having Hungarian cakes in my living room. Please okay. take Rachel up on that offer. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Others too. Just let me know in time. Wonderful to see you, CSP people, my literature, uh, our literature and poetry a, and music project. Wonderful to see all of us together. And with all of this COVID year not being so great for many, we in this group, I think, have enjoyed tremendous advantages that were not available to us before. And for that, I'm grateful. So, Daraba. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Rachel. We'll talk afterwards. Mm -hmm. I'll write to you. Bye.